Smith and Dr. Angus Fenton, and they're from uh, UTS here. So, and not very well, there's a the topic. So. This, this, this is the topic. Um, this is, a, as we heard, this is a very big subject, and I'll uh, say something where you can learn about the whole area of solar and energy efficiency in the early stages of my talk, which I think, just as a slight, if you want to learn about the whole story, um, this, this book, which is just out about a month ago, is available. It has all, it, it treats solar energy, PV and thermal, but it emphasises energy efficiency, which is an area, one of which aspect we're going to talk about tonight. There's a very large, substantial chapter on cooling, because we think that's a sadly neglected area, and hopefully some of the things that come out of tonight's talk. But anyway, this, this covers the whole box and dies, and it goes into a lot of uh, introductory things about why the world needs this. It's not only about energy and global warming, it's about resources, it's about the growth and population, all those things. Uh, and the final chapter has about 14 different scenarios for how these technologies will make the world of the future look. But anyway, that's you need to look at this um, to find that out. It's available from Amazon and all the usual sources there. Why is better cooling so important? Uh, these are a, a number of obvious things that are going on. Uh, cooling is... We, we, the emphasis in solar, in, in my early days in solar and even more recently, has been on heating, hot water collectors and all that sort of thing, and that's fine. But the area of cooling is, is really not until recently received a lot of it, the attention it deserves. It also has a role in energy supply, by the way, which we won't have time for that. So we're going to concentrate on uh, cooling. Now, as you know, air conditioning loads are going up. So we've got these peak grid problems in the summertime uh, rather than the winter nowadays. And I'll say a little bit about this urban heat island effect because uh, you notice that we deliberately put the word cities in the title and I'll show you in a, in a coming slide example of that in our own town here, Sydney. As you probably know, more than 50% uh, of the world now lives in cities and that is going to increase. In Australia it's already around 80% towns and cities. And they have unique problems. In fact, cities or city development and urban development contributes directly to global warming in a way which most people aren't even cognizant of. <coughs> so, what is the urban heat island? Well, here's a, a picture of the... I took a, We've got various graphs like this from around the world. Well, I took this one from, this, from our own Met Bureau, and it's uh, in Melbourne, as you can see. Uh, we, and we'll show you some related pictures from Sydney in a minute. But... Basically, what you see there is that the temperature at the countryside, as opposed to temperature in the CBD, and it rises gradually as you go from the outer suburbs into the CBD, <coughs> there are very, it's much cooler out there for all sorts of reasons. But predominantly, there are two things that go on. One is the sun gets trapped more, the solar absorbance or the albedo is higher. And secondly, it's, it's stored up in all the thermal mass, the, the roads and the pavement and, the, and all the construction materials. So, this is a major problem, and that heating, by the way, as we'll see in a minute, is, is a big issue in its own right. Not only because it can directly heat the globe on a large scale if there's enough cities, but secondly, because of the enhanced air conditioning it demands. And there are all sorts of other things come into play here. Uh, the smog, uh, how qual the quality of the outdoors, we're going to have more people than living in the cities. The cities have to be livable, so, so the air quality... We don't want the air quality going down, but that's what it's doing in, in, under these conditions. So we're looking at ways of getting rid of that heat without pumping, having massive increases in air conditioning loads. And Angus is going to talk in more details about some of the work we're doing here in the research and the actual systems we're developing for doing this. But I'm just going to talk simply about the broad concepts uh, in behind so that you can get a some fundamental insights, which surprisingly very few people have a few people seem to have a full full grasp of. So there are two aspects to cooling. It's not just about pumping heat out with a compressor. That's what we're trying to get away from, or minimum. It's about keeping as much of the heat out, which you can do in windows and paints, but in particularly on the roof. Now, you, and so it involves both the solar reflectance, or we use the word albedo. 
We want that high. And we also want the ability to pump the heat out of the building. And we do that through this, what we call the thermal emittance. That is the radiation coming off the surface into the sky. The amount of that is governed by, as Angus will go into a bit more detail, and I'll touch on the early stages, is the conditions of the sky, that is the atmosphere above you, play an important role in this, and it varies at various points in Australia and, and around the world. But we've been working with a couple of companies that do this sort of thing, and we're just uh, busily doing some, looking at the possibilities in Singapore, which are much more reduced because of the high humidity just recently. But... Um, on a couple of very big projects up there, 25,000 square metre rooftop. Uh, but the power savings we're finding in buildings in Australia range in between 30 and 70 per cent. That is the total power used in the building. Um, the air conditioning savings may even be higher than that. Now, this, this was a big surprise, and, and Angus may have touched on some details of why that happened, but it's, it's early days in the research. But we have excellent models for describing the heat going through the roof, and we can uh, our data is starting to, and Angus has developed some of you will talk about. Um, so we can, if we know the quality, the, what we've got on the roof, now this is a white roof, that's Darwin Airport, which is not in the town, it's out in the bush a bit, but uh, various buildings, uh, and some of which are actually in, the results are in this book, uh, including some of our own town here, uh, have this effect. Now, you can't paint all your houses white, although they do in Greece, but there are other ways, which I'll touch on as well, that you can paint coat, coat roofs uh, so as to keep them cool and coloured. That's one of the technologies we've worked on. Now, what this is about is the day and the night. This one's just a, a Google map the daytime, so what you're seeing is a reflected sunlight by the satellite. This, some of you may have seen, it was appeared in the Herald, and there's a few others around the world, but not many like this. This is a night... A plane flew back and forward over Sydney. You see the two parts of the image match. Now, what you're seeing on the one on the left is a, a thermal map. That is, it's, it's looking at the temperatures of various surfaces throughout downtown Sydney and a few nearby suburbs and parks and stuff. The blue areas are the coldest, and the red areas are the hottest, and the, the white areas are in between. Now, there's an interesting story in all this, and I won't have time to go into too much detail analysing it all. But it doesn't, and by the way, all these temperatures are hotter than the air, even the blue ones. But the, the temperatures around here are so hot that they're hotter even than the outside air temperature gets to in the rest of the day. And this is in 2, 3 a.m. in the morning. Now, this tells you that there's a problem. This is in the worst time of the year, which is in February, but, and, and, and Angus will say a little bit about the role of humidity and all incoming radiation. But the important point is you see these areas of white here down towards the airport, the factories of the warehouse or mighty warehouse and customs there. There are, there are several factors similar there. These are the lightest, the, the coldest. Whereas the CBD and the Bangaroo and all these places with lots of uh, concrete and, sorry, not uh, bitumen and uh, cavernous buildings that absorb the sun and trap, they, they get very hot. So it's about a five degree differential between these blue areas and this here. Um, and so, and there are other factors involved. It's not, there are, you have to worry about the R value in the roof. And what's interesting in this work, you might think, ah, the best thing is to crank up all the R values, which the latest building codes tell you to do. But in fact, for this work, if you get the right coatings, it's actually optimal to use Lighter R's and you can pump more heat out because R traps the heat in your building. High R traps the heat in the building as well. So you have to look at the situation, what's happening inside the building and everything. And we well, haven't got details to do all that, sorry, time to do all that tonight, but it's a tricky business that we've, we've come up with various strategies using the roof and the, the subroof design to, to maximise some of these things and the thermal mass. So the, the other thing about these buildings is that they tend to have uh, light materials on the roof. The suburbs nearby, Glebe and those places, are semi-warm. They're 